Hey, thank you so much for joining today. And I just want to appreciate and thank you, thank the team for putting this event together. This is such an important discussion to talk about smart cities, urban development in light of our modern age and modern technology. There's so many opportunities we have to design better, healthier, more inclusive and diverse communities. And one of the things that often gets overlooked is the balance of energy and energy within our environment. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today is how to mitigate that and why, why we need to do that, why we need to consider this as we think about planning out where we live, how we live, and uh, of the other aspects that go into that. So quick way of introduction, my name is Dan Stahoski. I live in America, uh, and I own a company called Essential Energy Solutions. But my story starts before that, actually, with uh, with my career, I was in the software tech industry, and I was working with one of the largest software providers, helping them build their cloud system. I was doing a lot of reporting analytics for them to build out how they're going to track the development of their cloud service. And in doing that, I was front row, front and center with their uh, interactions with their clients or customers and other users of these technologies that would enable things like the Internet of Things, where they could have monitors and systems in the now in the tunes of billions and trillions of sensors out there that can all be communicating together uh, in this vast system and service. They also looked at the uh, opportunities for artificial intelligence and how that was going to really create a revolution around how we operate. Um, with that was all these connected devices, which is where smart cities really come into play. And even your smart home with all the connected devices, things you can control right from your phone or your computer, uh, they can tell you and alert you to when the foot, when the water might have a leak or you might have a light on or a garage door open, things like this that are really valuable and beneficial. But you know, the, they all are communicating to each other and there's this wireless communication. So as I was helping this organization develop a part of their, their cloud service, at the same time at home, I was running into a situation where I had a daughter and family that had some health issues that weren't being, uh, that weren't easy to, to identify or diagnose and, or solve or, or help primary immune deficiencies, uh, neurological disorders, heart, heart issues, uh, nervous system issues. And I started to learn about how we are energetic beings and how our bodies are, are really, uh, we need light, we need quality light, and we, we need to be under in a low stress environment. And the term electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic fields was new to me at the time but I came to find that we operate at electromagnetic levels. Our, our body is resonating. Nikola Tesla, Albert Einstein, both have been known to say that all of life is energy, frequency, and vibration. And if you understand that, you understand life. And truly, that's who we are. Our body is resonating. We're, we're energetic beings. We're light beings. We are the light of the world. And yet the quality of light today isn't what it used to be. And I'm going to get into that. But what I ended up doing was going on a search, a global search really to find a technology and a product that I really could trust that was easy to use, that was uh, was not invasive, um, that was free to use other than the purchase of the product itself. But it could travel with me. Could you? I could use it but I could still use the technology as well because in my in my career uh, in, in the tech space, I couldn't get away from the technology. And I saw some real benefits for technology, especially for disabled people um, and helping create some, some opportunities in parts of the world and, and our communities where people are underserved and really technology can act as such a valuable asset to them but it needs to be done in a way that is biologically healthy. And what I found changed the narrative for my family, created a, a lot of stability. And ultimately what I found was that we need balance. One, we have malillumination, malillumination, which is poor quality of light. 
And I'll get into why that is, but then we all, and that creates an imbalance. An imbalance leads to stress. Stress leads to uh, knocking us out of balance, which is dis-ease. And that dis-ease is what ends up causing a lot of health issues. So as we get into this, that's a little bit of my background. I've been now sharing the technology as well as other op uh, other products or, or approaches and, and methodologies for solving these issues now for close to 10 years. And it's my privilege to be able to share this with you today. But let me get into a little bit of the history, and I'm going to switch to a, a presentation that will help guide our conversation here. So the conversation is around mitigating EMF. Uh, why this is important, and thankfully, the opportunity that we have to restore this balanced environment. So quickly, here's a little bit of my background, Dan Stahoski. Uh, I gave you a little bit of this. I've been doing this now for a number of years, and I'm going to be creating a, a nonprofit to help with this as well. But the key is that there's a history to our modern electromagnetic frequency pollution. This is EMF. You You may have heard of electromagnetic radiation things from our cell phones, but this quote by Andrew Goldsworthy is really, really timely. He says, our present exposure to man-made microwave is about a million, billion, billion, or one followed by 18 zeros times greater than our natural exposure to these frequencies. Author, Author Furstenberg wrote a book called The Invisible Rainbow. It's available by Chelsea Green Publishing. And in that book, he went through the history of electrification of the world over the last nearly 300 years. Started with just static electricity down with the Leyden jar and then the telegraph. We wrapped 30,000 miles of copper cables around our earth and our earth is a magnetic field. So wrapping that copper changed the dynamic of that, of that natural field. We then did power lines, radio, radar, television, satellites, home appliances, all the generations of wireless communication, up until now the fifth generation wireless. And I'll tell you that when I, it used to be there was 50,000 uh, low orbit satellites planned, but there's actually quite a bit more now. Um, see, Starlink, as of July 2023, had 4,519 satellites in orbit. You can see here what their what their current coverage is with the light blue and the dark blue is where it's cut, planned to come. They're eventually planning for 42,000 satellites, each with a five to six year lifespan requiring continual replacement. So they're always going to be changing these over. Uh, they, they actually started testing these in 2019. So some of those initial satellites are nearing end of life and will be coming re-entering into the atmosphere and burning up only to be replaced with more satellites. But the story doesn't end there. You can see like this is actually creating uh, a, a wrapper or coverage around the entire globe. No matter where you live, you will be affected by these uh, satellites and this satellite coverage, this microwave radiation that's coming down from these satellites. You can see these, these streaks here. Um, let me see if I can highlight that for you. Um, these streaks here are the, the uh, constellations right now. The others are just existing satellites. It's going to become a lot worse. See, the number planned for low orbit satellites now exceeds 1 million. Iridium launched the first communication satellite in 1998. Starlink, like I said, owns a little more than uh, 4,600 satellites. That's only half of about nine, the 9,000 total satellites out there. But here's what gets interesting is 147 companies and governments from 34 countries operate satellites. And in October 17, 2023, the journal Science was reviewing filings of the International Telecommunication Union, and they report that there were more than 90 filings for constellations of over 1,000 satellites each. 23 have over 5,000 satellites and 8 have over 10,000. But here's the whammy. Uh, eSpace out of France, owned by Greg Weiler, he plans, he's filed a plan for a mega constellation to include 116,640 satellites. That's in addition to the one he previously filed for with three 
127,000 satellites with the Rwandan government. So the number of planned low orbit satellites is now close, to, it's going to exceed a million. Why is this important? Well, these electromagnetic fields are a combination of invisible and electric magnetic fields of force. They are generated by Earth's magnetic field. Um, and uh, the sun and other heavenly bodies, as well as man's inventions, mainly through the use of electricity. So that's an important point. And Arthur Furstenberg really calls this out, that electricity is, is really not a friend to man or Earth. Here's the spectrum. We start very low with 10 hertz all the way up to, well, it goes even lower than that, but all the way up to the cosmic rays. The uh, things that we care most about are the radio spectrum as well as the optical spectrum. You can see here the visible light that we all see, the colors that we see, really only makes up a, a about 1% of this electromagnetic spectrum. And yet every day we are having to interact with this entire spectrum of electromagnetic fields, whether natural or unnatural. And the unnatural actually is in a condition, in a state that is incongruent with nature. And that incongruency creates a stress on uh, with nature. For instance, with our body, our cells are always interacting with each other. They're resonating with each other and they're resonating with the environment, with nature. Um, and when you get this unnatural force of electromagnetic fields, these man-made forces coming in, it, it creates a, a disturbance and a stress. And that stress is what leads to inflammation. So the key is how do we, you know, let, let's learn a little bit more about that and how do we start dealing with it? Because there's ionizing and non-ionizing frequencies. Again, here's, I like this chart because it kind of shows you an example of the things that make up the spectrum. So on the very low end, you've got uh, subways, you have the earth's fields, you have then, then power lines. And power lines, believe it or not, have been detected to create an electric field that actually reaches up to the ionosphere. And we'll get into what that is. There's an app, there, the part of the atmosphere that is, uh, I believe, 50 to about 500 miles above the Earth's surface. And it's full of electric charge. And that's where, where storms are generated and the jet stream is managed. Um, these... Oh, power lines can actually influence and affect that as well as if you keep going to the right here um, you have radio frequencies you have microwaves you have satellites cell towers um, you have radar it's all in that range and these are all man-made based off electricity that actually are incongruent with nature then you have infrared the visible light you have the uv radiation uh, from the sun you have x-rays then and gamma rays. And uh, the difference between ionizing and non-ionizing is that ionizing actually has a thermal component to it. That thermal component breaks down the cell structure and leads to either DNA damage or, or cell death. Whereas the non-ionizing goes about it a little differently. It's non-thermal, but it actually through a, a process I won't get into, actually leads to DNA damage and cell death as well. Uh, it was for a long time thought that non-ionizing radiation was uh, not harmful, but we've we've definitely come to find that is not the case. Um, so let's look at the atmosphere here. We have the main sea level or earth surface here, and then you have the ionosphere. It's the middle atmosphere. And that's where all the currents are going. Sun, the sun, the, the sun rays are coming in that uh, magnetosphere is blocking up to 99% of the radiation from the sun. And the what kit passes through interacts with the ionosphere. And there's there's ions going, changing and, and um, creating a balance up there uh, to then in, influence our weather and influence our environment. When all this is in balance, you have normal weather patterns. You'd have normal, you know, seasons. Um, there's always variations, but there'd be a normality to it. However, what we've noticed over the last several decades is a change to that normality. We've seen severe weather. We've seen climate crisis. And a lot of that has to do with the effect of 
the electrical field, these unnatural electrical fields now creating an a, a overwhelming density within the atmosphere. And that influences the jet stream as well as our the storms, weather patterns, and uh, just the weather conditions and climate climate conditions. See, we have to think about healthy ecosystems or eutrophic or dying systems, living or dying. In a healthy system, that visible sunlight, that UV radiation gets all the way to the bottom of these water systems and conditions that creates oxygen, creates vibrance and life within the ecosystem, within the marine life, which also then goes into all the agriculture and living situations where we find ourselves. But if the system is, is dying where sunlight, remember that malillumination where we get poor sunlight, can't penetrate the water, you start to get dying systems. And what I want to talk about, what I'm sharing with you today is that we have a lot of dying systems today, but that doesn't have to be our normal anymore. We can restore balance and health with uh, some, some simple steps. They're complex, they take commitment, but with there are solutions out there. And it needs to be a consideration because as we build out these, these uh, modern technology centers and smart cities that are um, driven through technology and communication, and we increase that electro density, we run into a situation if we're not careful where we actually create these dying systems or eutrophic systems and we're going to try to introduce technology to, to monitor those. Again, Internet of Things, these sensors, you can put sensors in the water to monitor that. Or you can even in soil, you can do soil systems and agriculture systems that can monitor moisture and microbiology. But again, it's all a band-aid if we don't address the underlying issue, which is electrodensity that from unnatural man-made EMF that creates the suppressive effect. Earth emits a natural 10 hertz frequency. I've kind of hit on that. The heart has two hertz. Uh, these things can be measured. EMF from cell phones, however, are in the gigahertz. So it's a dramatic change. Again, billions of times stronger, millions of times stronger. The, the, the signals from your phone to the cell tower are radio waves, but they call, they're call they called carrier waves too because they, they carry the data from your phone to the transmitter and back, that's how we get the information uh, to the phone calls to transfer the text messages or the emails. It's all off these carrier waves. Well, those carrier waves, they have da these data packets that act like clothes on a clothesline. And those data packets oscillate on their carrier waves. And that's a secondary wave that leads to a lot of stress and inflammation. Again, these are important facts to just be aware of and know that they do exist. It's real. In America, we have, in 2020, we had 417,215 cell towers. At the end of 2022, the last data set that I could find, we had exploded to, one, to almost 1.5 one million. What's really critical is that 747,400 of those were these small cell nodes which broadcast the fifth generation millimeter wave or 5G. These frequencies are even more hazardous to us because they are smaller, they, they penetrate deeper and create more uh, health issues, but they don't transfer, they don't transmit as far, which is why you need so many of them. Also, another layer of electrodensity is power lines. This is a really fascinating. There were about 240,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines in the United States and millions of miles of distribution lines carrying electricity to our homes, farms, schools, and businesses. Your country is probably very similar to this. That alone creates electrodensity that is harmful to the environment. It puts a suppressive uh, field on our farm animals, our food production, our soils, and on our own well-being. Robert Becker, he was the father of biophysics and bioelectricity. He devoted his entire life to research in this field. And he says he had no doubt in his mind that at the present time, the greatest polluting element in the Earth's environment 
isn't carbon, isn't CO2. It's not, the, it's not methane. It's the proliferation of electromagnetic radiation. This is a dramatic statement. This should stop us in our tracks. And I believe this quote was given in the 1990s, well before we exploded our uh, our cell our cell tower tower proliferation, all the satellites we're putting up now. Well before any of that, he had already said this proliferation of electromagnetic radiation was the radiation was was the greatest polluting element. Again, we have to think about well, this pollution isn't something we can see though but it's still something we're responding to. Again, remember what I said about how our, we only see about 1% of the electromagnetic radiation, uh, electromagnetic spectrum in the visible light range, but we still perceive and interact with the entire spectrum. And our bodies have been, it's shown that we have an allergic reaction to electricity, to this electromagnetic radiation our bodies are having uh, allergic reaction. Some are more severe than others, just like a natural, just like pollen or other, uh, other environmental allergens. Some people have more severe responses than others, but for everyone and is an, an allergen. And we need to consider this and take this into consideration as we plan things out. Dr. Jack Cruz says, if you change the electromagnetic field, you change the coherence of the system of life. Well, what is coherence? Coherence is predictable and stable. It's balance. It's homeostasis. It's where we want life to be. It's where life thrives. It's where we thrive when we're balanced. When we have that home, our bodies are always fighting for that. If you think about, if you get a cut on your hand, your body automatically starts to heal because it wants that homeostasis. It all, it's pre-programmed to have a natural healing response. But when we're ha when we're surrounded with incoherent energy, we run into a situation where our bodies won't heal as efficiently, where we're under static all the time, and that can lead. Uh, Dr. Klinghart has said that that leads to uh, clinical evidence that in a, without a low EMF environment, symptoms like ALS, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, other neurological diseases, and and um, uh, cardiac issues will not recover unless you're in that low EMF environment. So it's really important that we take this into consideration. Here's a longer quote. It says, every living and non-living creature on the planet vibrates at its own special frequency. Again, we all are resonating with, with, the, with the environment. And natural things were designed to resonate in, in balance together. So this would include humans and animals too. Different cells within our bodies vibrate at different frequencies to create our own special song or color mosaic. In the presence of acute or chronic illnesses, these vibrations change. They are also altered by things that we eat and do. The higher the frequency, the lighter and healthier the person or animal. Again, this is what we're striving for when we think about building healthy, happy uh, communities. We want our frequencies to be high, our, to be lighter, to be healthier, to be vibrant, full of energy. And we have a way to do that. We can solve that because as we learn and do more, this EMF has, is in the research. It's in the published peer-reviewed studies as causing effects on nature. Non-ionizing electromagnetic fields on flora and fauna, rising ambient levels. How, how species interact with natural and man-made EMF. Natural EMF, they go on to say, is a healing, uh, a healing effect. Man-made EMF, it's detrimental. It's, we're creating dying systems versus living systems. In our embrace of technology, we have completely altered the Earth's electromagnetic signature in which all life has evolved, in essence, bypassing the magnetosphere's protection. This is what they summarized one of their statements from their research here. Again, they went on to follow up with those two studies and said, hey, the lower level EMF effects on wildlife and plants, what research tells us? It says we are creating an environment where life on earth will never be the same. 
So ambient levels of EMF have risen sharply over the last 80 years. I showed you on that on that chart. Plants and animals, birds, pollinators, soil microbiology are perhaps more sensitive to EMF than, um, than humans. Plants experience an increase in perioxidase, a stress protein, even in increasingly negligible radiation levels, meaning that even low levels of man-made EMF are enough to create a stress response. And yet we're living today in an electromagnetic field and density that is extremely higher than a negligible level. Numerous studies across all frequencies and tax that indicate that current low level anthropogenic EMF can have a myriad of effects. The list goes on. I want to get to the good, the good news here. So again, just to give you, this isn't a one-off deal. This isn't new. Here is a list of, of studies from the 1970s to present, a summary statement of, of this, that there are hundreds to thousands of, of people who have researched and showed the problem. But now I want to introduce you to six farmers who broke that cycle. They're not just surviving, they're thriving. And I want to do this with these farmers as a showcase and a case study for what we can do when we plan out our urban developments or our communities and our smart cities that we can actually create in the midst of this electric density, a gardens of Eden, areas, I, you know, these islands that are free from the stress and the effects of EMF. So Steve Simpson's in Eastern Washington. He was a, he's a dairy farmer for 40 years. He was considered selling his farm due to lack of fertility and reduced milk production. He started to experience three years ago. He installed our, our geophil conditioner in October, 2022. Immediately, he saw the change in fertility and quality of milk. Within five weeks of installation, he told his wife, hey, it looks like we can keep on farming. He says, I can get back to farming again. I don't no longer have to be worried about, about losing my farm. His production increased by 30 per, some percent, and his pasture brought in 33% more in harvest this last summer than, than on average over the last 40 years. But the best part is his customers were calling and telling him that the milk was tasting better and it was creamier. There was a real change to the quality and the nature of the milk being produced because they were in an area now protected from the stress from EMF. Those cows are back in balance, they're in homeostasis, and they could milk, and that milk was getting all the rich nutrients that was they were designed to have. Philip Weaver, upstate New York, fertility and milking issues, high semitic cell counts. These are issues that dairy farmers across the country and the world have. Because it's not just farming practices. There are some, some farming practices that need to be changed and, and improved that would also address this. But these guys are already farming really well, really clean, regenerative in their approach. And yet they started having issues. They hadn't changed anything. They just started having having these issues that were becoming harder and harder to manage. And if we think about our own health, can we all agree that our health issues have become harder and harder to manage over the last five to 10 years? It's not a coincidence. Within the first two days of installing the geophil conditioner, his milking time reduced by 25%. He canceled an order for two new milking machines due to the time saving. So he saved money on those machines simply by installing a conditioner that not only increased his milking time, but it also improved the quality of the health of his cows, of his cattle. He improved the health of his family and of the pastures. The whole environment changed with the conditioner as opposed to just buying more machines. Really a tremendous success story for him. And he is super happy. He shares it with everyone that he runs into because he it, it's making a difference. Rod Meyer, uh, Southwest Minnesota, had 150 dairy cattle. He was struggling to get his somatic cell count down. This is how Tim, but also look at that increased average of one or two pounds per cow per day on 150 cows. That's thousands of dollars a day that he's, he's in, or thousands of dollars a month that he is um, increasing right to the bottom line simply by creating this balanced environment. Um, again, the store, Marvin Graver, dairy farmer out of Illinois, 
he's only had it for a, for four weeks. So he's only had the, he's only had this conditioner on his farm for four weeks. And already his somatic cell count is going way down. His production has ticked up half a pound per day. He told us, told us that his neighbor with Alzheimer's like conditions has had a total turnaround in her, in her health and her, her demeanor, how she interacts. Um, this was something that's very not noticeable to the entire community. He is seeing more and more symptoms of this EMF community. And these Amish farmers, they don't use electricity. And yet they're still affected by everything that's out in the environment from the cell towers, the power lines, and these 5G satellites. He is excited about this and he wants to continue to promote it throughout his community. Greg Fleming in Australia. He had 350 acres of corn silage increased 25%. He said this was the best harvest he's had in 30 years of farming this land. And it was the worst drought in history with 80 days over 105 degrees. This was, this was several years ago now, probably about four or five years ago that he had this. John Wood with cattle. He had a 70% weight gain improvement, which is just outrageous for the area of the country in Missouri there where he lives. First year, he butchered several months ahead of schedule which saves a ton of money. And not only that, uh, allows him to, to, to bring more cattle on so he can get his production up higher and really provide good quality, healthy food to his customers. Plus his forage and his yields have increased. So all these farmers are seeing a dramatic change. And I just want you to know that these, anim these, these animals are mammals. We're mammals too. And what what's happening with these cows are happening with horses they're happening with with pollinators with bees with people it's it's really a tremendous thing because we're creating a balance um again i talked about living and dying systems i'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly because i want to get to what our technology is because i'm sure you're wondering again it's essential energy solutions is the name of the company we're based in america the website is essential energy dot solutions that's essential energy dot solutions. Again, here's a map of the body and our, our frequency. One of the interesting things is with birds that's being affected is we're seeing massive die-offs when when new heavy radar or or radio stations or, or towers are being put up. Here in, in Norway, we saw um, about 50,000 bird, seabirds uh, the total population of these birds in, is only about 50,000 now after losing 15,000 endangered birds. But the numbers are a lot bigger and it can be depressing, except how are they growing this? Well, essential energy produces, we we sh are sharing with the world, we're sharing with you a subtle energy technology, which means there's no moving parts. Um, it is... Uh, it's all about resonance. It's all about energy and vibration, just like Tesla talked about. It was developed originally in the 1990s out of Australia and New Zealand. The applications grew from working with vehicles, with alternators, or putting spinning off EMFs to humans and health and farms and well beyond that now. We leverage the physics of light to create a coherent field of light. When this field interacts with systems at the molecular level, the coherent resonance creates a shield that protects against that chaotic EMF signals, restoring natural electromagnetic signaling and biochemistry to the degree that is genetically and biologically capable. So again, here's, here's one deal. I didn't bring uh, other samples, but on my website, I've got them. But we these, these stainless steel plates are tuned in such a way that they reflect this coherent light and it creates a tuning fork for you and the environment, which leads to the results that we're seeing, a reverse of all those, those negative effects of EMF. Again, it's about restoring balance and restoring a stress-free environment and an essential energy stress-free environment. That's what we're into, that's what we're doing and that's what we wanted to share with you today. So I just wanted to say thank you for your time Here's pictures of our products, but it's not about the product. It's about sharing the fact that while we are building, um, while we are building these 
these uh, plans for smart cities and um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to uh, turn off the slideshow now, but while we're building these smart cities and urban developments and these, these happy, healthy, vibrant communities, what we need to be really considering is the energetic field that makes that that envelops these communities our homes and our our communities and realize that we are all affected and some some people are more affected than others and so it's really our responsibility at this point to go ahead and produce these field these beneficial fields to the best of our ability across the globe to reverse the effects of electromagnetic radiation and by doing that we can both take advantage of the benefits of technology without the biological harm. So again, I want to say thank you for your time. I'm very honored to be able to be part of this, this event, and I wish you all the best.